Sue, have you looked into AB 215? No. That might be, might be something to put on an agenda. Okay. Is that a recent one? Uh, it's ongoing now with it's choose bill to have a low progress consult with HCD and adopt pro housing policies. Not that we don't have them, but yeah. Okay. It's in the Cal city's advocate today. All right. Troy or Rick, are we expecting anybody else? Is Brent going to be with us? Uh, no, Amy and myself will be oh. uh, helping out tonight. Okay, great. Hi, Amy. Okay, you want to get started? Uh, welcome to uh, the General Plan Advisory Committee meeting for June 23rd. And Troy, do you want to take roll? Yes, I will. Thank you, Mayor Nowak. Uh, Architectural Review Commissioner Will Nelson? Here. Planning Vice Chair, Planning Commissioner um, Chadwick Weiler. Here. Our newest GPAC member and recent Planning Commissioner addition, Alex Colfin. Here. And Council Member Carlson. Here. And Mayor Nowak. Here. Thank you, Troy. I don't have uh, I don't have information on where people can call in and things for public comment. Are they just is there somewhere where they uh, Zoom meeting ID where they can yeah. find that? Let me read that for you. I know, Mayor, you did a lot of reading of that at Council so yes. for you uh, tonight. Thank you. So Appreciate we are that. no problem. Uh, we are on Zoom, and for those that are familiar, and I think a lot of us are at this point, uh, the webinar ID on Zoom is nine six four. 0823-4638. The passcode to enter is 252-216. And of course, if you just have a phone and want to call in, the call-in number is 669-900-6333. Okay. And I will try to remember to do uh, public comment, but if I forget, please, people, uh, let me know. But we will start off with public comment first. So is there any general public comment? Uh-oh. Yeah, we have a little, little staticky problem on public comment. 
if you want to wish, to, if you uh, want to make a public comment, please raise your hand in the Zoom feature or star nine if you're calling in. Hear me now, Madam Mayor? I do hear you now, Larry. Thanks. Okay, I know what it was. All right, we do have one hand raised. One moment. Okay. Frank Hall has been moved over. He can speak when he's ready. Okay, Frank, please go ahead. Frank, you'll need to unmute yourself. Go ahead, please. Good evening, Mayor Nowak, Council Member Carlson, members of the Planning Commission and the ARC. My name is Frank Hall. I live at 3 Millican Court, Martinez, 94553-9786. I am the general partner of Contra Costa Boulevard Limited Partnership and have been since November of 1982. We own 555 and through 559 Contra Costa Boulevard in Pleasant Hill in the northern part of Pleasant Hill at the north is Dun Edwards and at the south is batteries plus bulbs. And due to a downsizing uh, because of the economy of Dun Edwards, we have a newly created but vacant 4,800 square foot space. Our limited partnership needs to be part of a process to review retail business zoning as it relates today um, because we have some difficulties with it. We have some issues with it. In addition, retail business has changed a great, great deal since before the pandemic, uh, during the pandemic, and um, with the plethora of uh, direct sales. So we need, um, we need to have a discussion with staff regarding opening up more potential uses and uses that are more germane to the year 2021. We also would like to engage staff, staff in our concerns about signage along I-680 where there are 148,000 to 153,000 cars a day. And it's our belief that the sign code as it exists really does not address a building that has two frontages. We're on the main arterial Contra Costa Boulevard and we want to attract and notify people on 680. A bit of background, in 2014, we came before you. We asked for larger signs for batteries plus bulbs. They were awarded. The proof is in the pudding. Mr. Tom Schultz, the franchisee, stayed open during the pandemic because he was a critical use. And his sales have been very good because people know where he is. Um, so please consider my request to somehow uh, start a process where we can have a discussion. We're prepared to move forward as quickly as possible, positively and productively with staff on both issues. Staff has my contact information and I'd be willing and would look forward to talking to any or all of you about these issues. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Frank. I was gonna ask if you, if staff had your contact information, so I'm glad you mentioned that. Thank you. You're welcome. Larry, do we have any other public comment? There are no other hands raised at this point. Okay. Great, we will move on to, um, Item three, general plan alternatives and housing element discussion. And Rick, are you gonna lead that or Amy? 
Well, I'm going to start off on a few slides, and then Amy's going to take over the hard stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm going to give you the recap, if you will. Um, Amy, can you share the presentation then? I don't see her in our list anymore. Here it is. Oh, there she is. <laughs> Phew. All right. So next slide. So uh, tonight we are going to review, if you remember, we, we met on May 12th and the GPAC looked at the initial sites that were being discussed for the housing element. And we had a lot of discussion on an approach and some questions about how we could look at some various sites, which ones were good ones to move forward on, which ones we might want to add to the pile. And there was a lot of discussion about uh, densities that could be appropriate within these areas. So what we've done is taken a look at that information and come back with some revised inputs. Next slide. So tonight, um, get a quick overview of that. We're going to go through the build out analysis again, again, using the GPAC's direction on looking at some of these alternatives. What are our current sets of sites? And then we'll be looking for your discussion on these sites and whether they are ready to move forward. Uh, next slide, or next two, I guess. So at our last meeting, we talked about what's required in the housing element. Um, we talked about the six cycle requirements. That's the number you're currently in for what's done with HCD or the state's housing and community development department. We looked at the preferred alternative that was developed a year ago, more so more than a year ago um, with the public when we had the multiple day charrette uh, there at uh, city hall. Um, but because, uh, as you know, the delay in getting that process forward and the delays from COVID, um, we've now gotten to a position where the housing element can be updated at the same time as the general plan. And council agreed that we should go forward with that kind of motive. So that's why the GPAC is now in the middle of housing topics in addition to overall land use. But housing is an important key component of land use alternatives. That's why we're spending this time on it. And this is one of the bigger challenges for the community for finding the amount of housing that the state is requiring of the city is an important number to hit. And it's also a very hard number to hit. Lots of jurisdictions are finding themselves with much bigger numbers from HCD as far as what they call their RENA number or the regional housing needs allocation. And every jurisdiction gets one of these. These numbers were all passed down um, from ABAG after working uh, with all the local jurisdictions and came up with a distribution for each uh, jurisdiction of what they need to meet. And that's what we look at this build out. That is what could happen. Uh, this isn't build out to the, to the walls, if you will. We're not looking at what's the highest possible density and we put that on every single property and what would that yield? We have to, through the housing element, look at what's likely built out on these properties given the uh, designations, or even if we want to change the designation on a property, from a, one kind of residential to another or from a commercial to a residential, those kind of changes are being looked at. So the next slide. So just as a reminder, these are the numbers we're looking at. The magic number, uh, we give you the fifth cycle just as comparison. And you can see the fifth cycle, you had to produce sites that were for 448 units. And for this cycle now, eight years later, they're looking for us to identify sites for 1,803 units. To give you a reminder, I'd like to highlight that we're talking about sites. Um, the city is not responsible for the construction, development, or funding of these housing units, but you are required to make sure that there's adequate space available, that, there, that you've taken away all the constraints to housing development that need to be addressed, that you might look at things that are changing your zoning code, such as how much parking do you require on a site? What are the setbacks that are required? How tall can a building be? And part of what we're doing in the overall general plan framework is also looking at your zoning code. And we'll be developing sets of objective design standards as well as changes to your zoning code, which will also um, tie in very cleanly to this housing element and to the overall general plan. So it's great that you're getting all of your tools in line to accomplish a purpose. It makes it easier for us to uh, demonstrate to the state that you're going to be meeting the housing numbers that are available to you. 
and many of the things that they're going to require you to do, you'll already have started. So that's fantastic. Um, so what Amy's going to do in the next several slides is again walk you through all the sites we talked about last time. She'll talk to you about the yields that those sites develop um, and how we came up with those kind of numbers in general. Now to get to the end of the presentation, you'll find that we actually, through these scenarios, are meeting the lower income, that being the very low and low. We're actually a little short on moderate and above moderate, which is not a bad place to be because many developments, while we are able to count them because they might have more than 30 dwelling units per acre as low income, they sometimes don't always come in that way. You may have a very nice project at 30 dwelling units per acre that the rents are higher than low income rates. So you end up getting more of the moderates and above moderates as the world develops. And that's what you have to report in your annual report to HCD is not only what you built, but how those things built and how they perform under the different income categories for your community. So with that, we're going to walk through the sites. The overall goal is for, uh, once again, for the GPAC to weigh in on uh, the appropriateness of the sites, the appropriateness of the assumptions that we're making for these future locations, and to provide some guidance that we're in the right uh, ballpark. Our next step is to take these out to the public and have a discussion with the public about what's being talked about um, for the future of the community. And it's not as uh, intense as last time because we're not talking about all different kinds of land uses, but this time focusing on housing, want to get the public's input on where we're going overall. And then we'll be off to briefing the planning commission and the city council and getting final direction on a preferred alternative uh, later this summer. So with that, uh, Amy, I will let you take over and talk about build out and project sites. Great, thank you, Rick. Uh, let's see, there we go. So just, I mean, Rick touched on a lot of this, um, but just to kind of briefly review, uh, we're doing a build out, which kind of predicts the number of residential units. And later we'll talk about jobs um, produced by each uh, land use alternative. Um, so we're not going to be talking about jobs today because we're really focused on um, how many residential units the city can support, um, but this will definitely be part of a part of the conversation later on. As Rick mentioned, um, Pleasant Hill is required to provide over 1,800 units, excuse me, provide the capacity for 1,800 units uh, within the next uh, eight years, which is quite a feat. Um, and it's something that cities and counties all over California are facing. Um, so part of this build out analysis is, is to really determine whether the city's current land use um, has enough capacity to meet this RENA requirement. And so part of the discussion today is what kind of changes can we make to the land uses and have we made the appropriate changes to our land use land uses and land use assumptions to meet this RENA requirement. Um, part of the discussion, it's not a requirement of the current housing, um, housing element cycle, but um, it is a possibility since um, we are currently also working on the general plan, which is a 20 year time frame. Um, at the same time, we're working on the housing element, which has an eight year planning time frame. Um, it is something that you can consider of whether or not you want to and I'll find the capacity for additional housing units so that when eight years are up and we're, we're doing the housing element again for the seventh cycle, um, you are still within that 20 year time frame for the general plan. So if the general plan is able to plan for the next housing element cycle, perhaps the seventh cycle process will be just a little bit easier. Um, it was a bit of a shock for the sixth cycle this time, what we're going through right now, but it is something that you guys can consider is how much capacity you want to provide for at this time during this process. All right, just a very high level overview of the methodologies that we're using. Um, we're using assumed densities. And so as Rick talked about, um, part of the conversation we have today is, are these densities appropriate? Um, is, do we want them higher? Do we want them lower? And each site um, and each land use designation uh, is paired with an assumed density. And that's how we calculate how many um, housing units are estimated to uh, build out on any specific site. 
So the areas that we're considering in this build out include the sites, uh, which we are talking about today. That'll be the bulk of the discussion. Um, not part of the discussion today, but still part of our overall uh, arena um, effort is we'll be looking at vacant parcels um, in areas out around the city outside of these sites. Um, we're also looking at ADUs and ADUs are, the number we use for ADUs is dependent on, you now we take a look at the city's history of developing ADUs over the last couple of years. And then we project forward using an informed look at um, the city's history. And so you will see um, kind of line items in the summary table at the end of this presentation. So another thing that Rick mentioned was income categories. And so uh, RENA splits up its targets by income categories. And so we have to provide, we have to show that the city can support certain numbers of units under each income category. Um, and how we determine um, which units go to which category is very generally determined by density. Rick talked about their um, mentioned there are some nuances to that, but um, very generally we, um, we use density to identify which uh, units go where. So um, a higher density development will typically go into a lower income category, whereas a lower density development will typically go into a higher income category. All right, so we're about to go into the meat of this presentation. Um, there are a lot of sites that we want to go through, and so um, in an effort to you know give every site a chance to be heard, uh, I'll ask that we keep our questions until I've gone through all of them, and then um, definitely happy to go back and revisit any of them to clarify anything or answer any questions. All right, so A through N, most of these are sites that um, the GPEG had talked about last time. There are, we've got the DVC Overflow Parking Lot, Chilpin Chingo Park, Winslow Center, um, kind of at the Pleasant Hill Taylor intersection, we've got the Mangini Delu area, JFK University, um, the parcels around on and around the Ace Hardware Store, the Gregory Gardens Shopping Center. Um, the Salvation Army site, we got the Pleasant Hill Gregory Lane intersection, the Gregory Contra Costa intersection, the Jewel Lane neighborhood, Beatrice area, Monument Triangle area, and the former JC Pen JC Penny Furniture Store site. So I'll be going through each of these sites um, in a little bit more detail. Um, we'll talk about assumed densities, how many um, units could possibly be supported on this site. Then we'll kind of outline some of the issues that uh, that should be considered and what the staff recommends moving forward. I should also note that there are two additional sites that um, after discussion with staff, uh, we've added for, for consideration and that would be the Monument Triangle area and the former JC Penny Furniture Store site. All right, so uh, the DVC overflow parking lot um, is an 11 acre site, but we are only assuming about five acres would convert to housing. We're assuming a density of 70 dwelling units per acre, and if built out at 70 dwelling units per acre, it could support- What about this? I'm uh, sorry? Does someone wanna make a comment? All right, so- um, if developed out at 70 dwelling units per acre, um, this site could support about 350 units. However, this uh, using this site would require a conversation with an owner, um, but staff is recommending that we keep this inventory, keep this in the inventory and to begin conversations with the owner on this site. Next is Chilpin Chingo Park. It's about 2.5 acres with an assumed density of 20.9, if developed at this density, it could support about 52 units. Um, some major issues is that it's located in an underserved area um, and staff does recommend removing it from the inventory and not considering it as part of the housing element. Um, I should also note that uh, based on a comment provided at the previous GPAC meeting, um, and discussion at the previous GPAC meeting, uh, the GPAC also had discussed that this would not be a good site for the housing sites inventory. We've included it here today just as, you know, 
full circle loop, uh, making sure we come back to it, and making sure that um, everyone is on the same page that this is a site that we're not recommending um, to move forward with the housing inventory. All right, the next site is uh, the Winslow Center, um, or I should say uh, the area around the Winslow Center. I wanna clarify that um, this development assumption is not assuming that we would develop over the Winslow Center, but rather around it. So this site is uh, 2.92 acres um, and at an assumed density of 13.9, dwelling units per acre, it could produce up to 40 units. This also requires a conversation with the owner. Um, however, staff would recommend keeping it in the inventory and to pursue conversation with the owner. All right, the next site directly east is the Mangini Delu area. Um, I want to note really briefly that this site looks a little bit different in um, the memo provided as part of the staff report. Um, previously, uh, it had only shown kind of the middle part of the Mangini Delu area, uh, and that had just, uh, that was a boundary of the areas that had increased in density. However, we have now added um, additional areas to complete the Mangini Delu area on the eastern side of um, this site, excuse me. Um, and so as a result, we've also added in the potential capacity of this area that we've added in. Um, so that's why the numbers here will look a little different than the numbers in your staff report. And that's why the summary table at the end um, is a little different than the summary table in your staff report. So in total, um, this area adds up to uh, over 25 acres. Um, the eastern section, which is the lowest density area, um, estimated uh, is assumed to develop at 3.2 dwelling units per acre. The northern section um, estimated to develop at 8.3, and then the southern section estimated to, ve to develop at 20.9 dwelling units per acre. So the northern section and the southern section that I mentioned, the densities that we have used to calculate this round um, of numbers uh, are higher than what they previously were. This was um, to reflect a conversation that we had with the GPAC during the last meeting. So if developed at um, these assumed densities, the site could provide uh, over 200 units. Um, this is also assuming that the existing houses on the site would go away. Um, so it would net around 202 total units. Um, some of the issues as mentioned is that it includes existing homes, which uh, if we decide to move forward with this, um, will require a program in the housing element to address uh, relocating these families. Um, however, staff does recommend moving forward with this site. The next site is the JFK University parcel. Um, it's around seven, oh, excuse me, it's a little under five acres. Assumed density is 70, 70 dwelling units per acre. Um, and at that density, it can support uh, around 340 units. It does also require a conversation with the owner. And another downside is that it's directly adjacent to the highway. However, staff recommends keeping it in the inventory and to go ahead and pursue conversations with the landowner. All right, next site is um, the Ace Hardware store. So that is, if you look on the picture to your right, the aerial to your right, uh, the Ace Hardware building is the one on the bottom, and then it includes the parcel directly north of it, um, which abuts Missoula Drive. Um, so in total, this site is 2.45 acres. Um, assumed density is 30 dwelling units per acre. Um, and if kept in the inventory, this site would be a mixed use site, which assumes only 75% of it would go to housing. And so based on all of these assumptions, we estimate that this site can support about 55 units. Again, this will require a conversation with the owner, but staff also recommends keeping it in the inventory and to pursue conversations with the landowner. All right, next, um, 
is the Gregory Gardens Shopping Center. The site is 3.59 acres. Um, assumed density is 30 dwelling units per acre. Uh, it is also another mixed use site. So 75% of it is assumed to be housing. Um, given all of those assumptions, we estimate that this site can support about 80 units. Um, again, it requires a conversation with the landowner. Uh, some development constraints include that uh, it's a relatively shallow site. It has existing active uses. And so because of that, we will also need to review um, the lease agreements for these uses. Um, however, staff recommends keeping this in the inventory. Um, and as part of that, to pursue conversations with the landowner and to also start reviewing the lease agreements. And next is the Salvation Army site. This is 2.27 acres. Uh, if we assume that it develops at 30 dwelling units per acre with a mixed use designation, it could produce about six units. Um, this requires a conversation with the landowner. And another big issue is that it has uh, some ongoing environmental issues. It's also a very, very small lot. As you can see, it only produces six units. And so staff recommends removing this from the inventory. All right, the next site um, includes several different parcels around an intersection, the, Greg the Pleasant Hill Gregory Lane intersection. Um, in total, uh, we're looking at around 6.3 6 acres, um, also mixed use, assumed density is 30 dwelling units per acre. In total, it could support uh, over 140 units. This would also require conversation with the owners. Um, there are many relatively new and active uses on these in this area. And as a result, we would still need to review the lease agreements um, for these businesses. Uh, however, staff recommends keeping it in the inventory and to pursue conversations with owners and to review lease agreements and um, consider selecting sites within this area. So maybe not everything would redevelop, but maybe there are select parcels within this greater site that we think would be appropriate to keep in the inventory. All right, next is the, uh, the lot on uh, the Gregory Lane Contra Costa Boulevard intersection. This is 2.35 acres. Again, another mixed use site. Um, assumed density is 30 dwelling units per acre. And uh, we assume that it can support 52 units. Um, it would also require conversation with the owner. We would also need to review uh, lease agreements uh, for existing uses. Excuse me, however, staff recommends that we keep this in the inventory. We begin conversations with the owner and that we should begin reviewing the lease agreements to see if there are any viable buildings. All right, next is the Jewel Lane neighborhood. The site is around 1.6 acres. Um, if we assume it to the assumed density, excuse me, assumed density is 30 dwelling units per acre. And at that density, this could support uh, around 41 units. And that is assuming the seven existing homes are um, replaced. So some issues is that this is an existing neighborhood with existing homes. Um, and as a result, it will require a program within the housing element to address family relocation. However, the staff recommends that we keep this inventory and keep this in the inventory. And next is the Beatrice area. This site is around 8.45 acres. Uh, assumed density is 30 dwelling units per acre. Um, and we estimate that it can support 249 units. This is also assuming that four houses are removed and these are mainly along Cleveland Road. Um, again, it will require a program to address family relocation. And another major issue is that most of these parcels are owned by the flood control district, um, which um, is indicated in the blue shaded areas. And so building in a uh, flood zone is not prohibited. However, it does make development a little bit comp more complicated and potentially increases um, the cost of developing housing there. Uh, staff recommends, however, that we keep this in the inventory and to begin conversations with the flood control district. 
The next site is the Monument Triangle area. This is a staff recommended site. It is a it is 7.22 acres. Um, again, a mixed use designation, uh, assumed density of 30 dwelling units per acre. And we estimate that it can support 162 units. This will require a conversation with the owner again. However, uh, staff recommends that we keep this in the inventory and to start those conversations. All right, last but not least, uh, the former J.C. Penney Furniture Store site. This site is 5.57 acres. Um, we are assuming a density of 20 point, uh, excuse me, it's going to be uh, 49.9 acres. Uh, it should be reflected in your staff report, I apologize. Um, so this site still requires a conversation with the owner. Um, however, we recommend keeping it, staff recommends keeping this in the inventory and that we should start pursuing conversations with the owner. All right, so in total, we come out to uh, over 2000 lower income sites, 135 moderate income sites, 277 above moderate sites for a total site count of uh, 2,417. And below you'll see that I've broken it out by the GPAC sites, which are all the sites that we just talked about. We also have added in a line for the vacant sites. So you'll see that vacant sites don't really produce any lower income sites, but do produce just a handful of moderate and um, over 100 above moderate sites. We're assuming that over the next eight years, um, there will be about 320 ADUs developed in the city. And so those can be counted towards the lower income RENA requirement. The bottom line shows the difference. And basically it shows you how much more we have left um, to make up, how much left we, how many, excuse me, how many more units we need until we meet uh, our RENA targets. So you'll see that we are, doing really, really well in the lower income category. Um, we're still a little short in the moderate and the above moderate income categories. However, total count is above our RENA requirement. Um, I also want to add that the housing unit totals um, from the GPAC sites specifically do not include the sites that were not recommended for inclusion in the sites evaluation. All right, with that, um, want to, uh, open it up for discussion. Also, um, any questions that you might have on any of the specific sites. Um, we do want to discuss um, potentially if there are any additional sites we should consider for the moderate and above, above moderate income sites and whether or not the densities that you've seen in this presentation are appropriate for these sites. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll end it there and um, open it up for discussion. So Amy, just a couple of questions. Um, <clears throat> what about um, those projects that are currently underway? We have um, 85 Cleveland that may not be completed till after the cycle begins. Uh, we have the choice and aging site that likely won't be completed until after the cycle begins. Do those, would those count toward the sixth cycle or would, would they count toward the fifth cycle when they were approved? It would depend on um, when their permits were pulled. Um, Rick, did you want to add any more spe specificity to that answer? No, I think it's anything after June, 2022 could be counted towards your sixth cycle. Um, but there's a number of things that aren't in the presentation today. One would be projects that are already approved but pull a billing permit after your projection period starts. The other would be a build out of miscellaneous infill sites within the community. We've been focusing just on the major redo areas or vacant sites. So there are other locations within the community that could increase in intensity a little bit based on an underutilization. And then we also have uh, accessory dwelling units or ADUs, which uh, we can add to this as well. Amy, that's what, 64? Uh, 320 over eight years. Over eight years, okay. Yeah. That's the annual. So we do get uh, units from that. So there's other things that are adding into this equation going forward. Okay, so your uh, June your June date is the permit date for those? 
new construction that's already been approved, but permits may or may not have been issued already? When your projection period starts, which is six months before your actual uh, cycle starts. I think your cycle starts January. 23, I believe. Yeah, so your projection period starts in June of 2022. And, but when you say projection, does that mean not started yet? Even approved. though your period, yeah, even though your period hasn't started, any units that pull permits within that six month period before oh, okay. count to six cycle instead of the okay. Fixed cycle. All right. So because we have quite a bit of potential there between eighty five Cleveland and uh, the choice and aging site is eighty nine, I believe, something like that, and the eighty five Cleveland is what one hundred and eighty something. So that's something like that. So, um, Troy, you know those numbers? Uh, the, four, the 490 Golf Club is 81 affordable and one manager's unit. So that's market rate. Right. And then 85 Cleveland, uh, the final number I believe was in the 180s range. I'd have to, if you, I can easily look it up if you need that number. No, no, I just, I just get, you know, I'm just thinking certainly the choice in aging may not be at the point because of a lot of their fundraising to be pulling permits until after the June date. And I don't know about 85 Cleveland. Um, oh, and then there's the potential for the 401 project. Coming right. Back. Right. 401 Taylor coming back. And that would be probably a moderate or above moderate housing. So. I would, I, would tend, I would tend to think 490 Golf Club, there is a chance it could stretch into that general time frame. I'm pretty sure 401 Taylor and 85 Cleveland will definitely pull permits prior to that um, mid-2022 date. I could be wrong, but that's just my feeling right now. Right. Okay. Um, okay. Um, do people, other people have any general questions or do you want to just go site by site and discuss them? Uh, Alex? Mayor, if I could uh, interrupt real quick yep. before yep. you dive into the site by site uh, section. Sure. Um, I, I, I thought I had looked at this uh, because if you were within 500 feet of any of these sites because of how it's structured, um, you should recuse from uh, discussion just for that site. Okay, so, just for that uh, site. Yeah, and I, I'm pretty sure. Uh, uh, you and Ken are safe, if you will. Yep. I believe Chadwick is safe, and I think Will is safe. Although Will, if you give me, well, if you, I, I can check real quickly, Will, if you want to send me. But Alex one. may have a one. Alex a has with already, one of them. Yeah, Alex has one. Yep. So okay, I would just be conscious of that while you guys go through the sites. Okay, that's great. Uh, in if if they have to recuse themselves, do they need to step away, or can they just be silent during that portion of the discussion? I think if they turn off their video and mute themselves, okay, um, that, that will be fine. sufficient. And then I, I have everyone's email, so I can email them when they can come back on. Okay, all right. Provided Great. everyone has access to email. Okay. We oh, well, I, I've got Alex's uh, cell phone, so I can text him as well. Okay. Um, uh, Ken. Yeah, just real quick, as we go through the sites, I know one of the big questions are going to be, if we're looking at density, what are we looking at building height wise, if yeah. there's some way to kind of get a feel for that. Um, I know there's community members that are concerned about that. Yeah, when we talk about each site, when we get to the denser sites, if we can give us some idea how high that's going to have to go in order to meet those densities, that would be helpful to know. Okay, any other broad general questions before we go to the individual sites? I don't, sorry, I don't see Will on here. So I've got to, I got to scroll. Uh, you know what we might do, um, the two sites that staff recommends we're moving, we might just get consensus and, and see if we're just going to remove those sites and that will kind of limit well, I, that. I mean, yeah, I, would, I think, Tilpin Chango, we all sort of agreed to last time to review, except for Alex, who just wasn't here. So right. um, I, I think we can certainly agree on Chilpin Chango. And, and the second one we're moving was the Salvation Army, the 0.27, right? right? Does anybody have a problem with removing the Salvation Army site? No. 
I'm seeing everybody agreeing with that. So well, with that. I also, if I could interrupt real quick, yep. um, I don't know what's the best strategy, but there is a member of the public that has their hand up. So you could take comment now, have your discussion, oh, okay. maybe take comment again, or have them until the end, it's your option, which you would rather. Yeah, that's fine. We can, we can take the public comment now, and then maybe we'll wait till the very end and take it again after we've gone through all the sites. So okay. uh, if you want to let Jack in. Can I get the screen sharing so I can put up the timer or are we good like this? Well, you time it. Can you just see the timer yourself, Larry, and just, uh, you know, make a noise if it goes to I, three I minutes. I can see the timer. I have new glasses and I will make Excellent. the sound. All right, great. Let me bring Thank Jack you. over. Okay. Jack, you want to unmute yourself and you can go ahead. I had to find the unmute. Uh, this is Jack <laughs> Prosek, uh, uh, Pleasant Hill, a longtime resident uh, and homeowner. Um, for, um, good evening, uh, Mayor Nowak and uh, the rest of the gang there. Um, I've sent a couple emails to uh, to Troy, uh, he's responded to part, parts of my questions, and I was pleased at least to see that uh, he did res that the uh, uh, information for Site D has been mo uh, modified to include the eastern part of the Mangini Delu property. Um, I count now uh, that there are seven different levels of density that are that are uh, shown there, and um, I have to piggyback now on uh, Council Member Carlson's comment that, yeah, the general public has no clue what these densities mean. Are, are, are we talking three, five, seven, 10 story buildings, or maybe even something taller than that in order to meet these kinds of densities that, you, that you're talking about? Um, and I, somebody made a reference earlier to a, uh, to, um, I, th I think it said more than 30. I'm not really sure because uh, you've got uh, a whole bunch of properties that are right at 30. So uh, I'm not sure whether that's more than 30 or less than more than 29 or more than 31 uh, is the break point on that issue. A um, couple of things that I noted is going through here. There's several sites. Uh, on which uh, there's going to be a loss of jobs, most notably the JFK University site, as, at least as I understand it, because it, it appears to be shown as totally housing and, and no multi-use um, office or other occupancies on that site. So there will be, definitely be a loss of jobs in the area. Likewise, there'll be a much smaller, but loss of jobs at the JC Penney site and uh, uh, a couple of others uh, that are going from currently being retail or office use to being totally housing. Um, I'm uh, a little surprised to see that uh, the lowest densities are all assigned on the Mangini property because uh, and and the uh, Winslow Center property, uh, in part because I thought that would be one of the prime spots for uh, for a more intense development than it appears that uh, that uh, you're uh, planning on at this point. Um, it'll also be a oh the Winslow building I stumbled across as I was cleaning house here the other day. Um, the Winslow Center building itself has been on borrowed time for almost 10 years now. The structural engineer gave it a five-year um, life and then has, I think, been renewing that each year. Uh, but it's uh, long since uh, passed its uh, life and it definitely needs to be uh, replaced or torn down, simply torn down and clearing the site. And quite frankly, when the when the uh, Rec and Park District was doing their master plan, 
uh, one of my recommendations was that they considered selling that site because I think it's far more valuable for a more intense development than parkland and uh, possibly acquiring some parkland elsewhere and or using those funds to improve the new library park as I refer to it. Um, I think uh, that really covers, oh, the one big disconnect that I had uh, too was in going from, from the lists of the individual sites to the, uh, uh, to the chart and at, at the end of the report Troy's aware of this. Uh, I have no clue as to uh, how you arrived at the distribution of the numbers uh, within that chart. And I have no ideas at this point uh, what the vacant sites are that are that are listed there, nor how you, uh, there was a brief mention of the methodology, but it, it didn't uh, register to me uh, on how you came up with the number of of um, ADUs in the city. And I realized that those would be uh, mostly, if not exclusively concentrated in the single family residential areas. But I do appreciate very much that uh, your efforts are all at, at putting more intense development where we already have development other than single family residents. And uh, I don't know if I have any time left, but uh, I think it's time for me to sign off. All right, thanks, Jack. Okay, let us then um, go back to the first site. So any um, comments on the DVC site? Can, can somebody give me an explanation of why the five out of the 11? I assume that's because we're assuming that DVC is still gonna need parking there? Yes, that's correct. Okay. They're, they're gonna want parking and probably a shiny new garage from the developer. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that is very true. Uh, probably for the housing and for the, for the college. Um, and um, on 70 dwelling units per acre, Amy, maybe we can just address this now. What do, what do we, what are we assuming the number of stories are instead of just worrying about height? What, what is the number of stories that we think is going to be needed to meet that number? So there's not a hard answer for that, um, partly because um, a lot of it has to do with design of the building and of the site. Um, I think Rick mentioned that we are working on the, uh, the objective design standards and as part of the implementation of the general plan, um, the zoning code will also be updated, which will also have um, some requirements in terms of the building bulk and structure. Um, and so at this time, I can't give a very definite answer, but there are processes later on um, for that are also open to the public um, that can inform what this looks like. So if we're not looking for a super, super tall building, there are ways to make sure that it blends in with um, the existing fabric of the neighborhood. Um, Rick, was there anything else you wanted to add to that? Okay, so in this kind of range, it'll depend a lot too on how big the units are. Mm -hmm. um, but you're probably looking at at least 70 feet. Okay. Because I think, Rick, can, correct me if I'm wrong, or maybe some of the planning guys, what was the units per acre on 85 Cleveland? Oh, Troy, maybe you know, what's the number of units per acre on 85 Cleveland? And that's, uh, of course... Yeah, I was just going to jump in. I was going to let Rick speak, but, um, to, you know, I'm not saying this is going to be universal, but um, right. the density for, let's say, 490 Golf Club was in the um, 80s range, and that, as you recall, is a three- to four-story building, probably smaller units, as Rick had said, whereas the units on uh, 85 Cleveland, they were up to in the 90s, uh, 
mid nineties density units per acre and that topped okay. out at, um, four stories, if you will. Okay, uh, just, so, just to give people that are listening a framework and some idea of an area. Okay. And I would note that uh, 85 Cleveland though did have subsurface parking. So right. That parking had to come out to the site and it ch kind of changes things. Right. Anybody else have any other questions or comments on DVC parking? No, I think we include it. My, certainly included. I, I'm not sure we couldn't do a little more dense here. You're backing up to choice in aging, which will have a four story uh, building on it at, at a higher elevation. Um, right. And I would expect some of this could be more like student housing. So a lot more studios or one bedroom. So this is one where I think we could actually do more of a density similar to, you know, closer to the 90 than the 70. That's my only thought there, if we need it at some point. I, I was going to chime in and say the same thing. I mean, if we go through a planned process with DVC, uh, my understanding is there's been at least some goal of theirs for a while to consider housing that's never really panned out as anyone planned, especially with a community college level, even given the prestige of DVC. Um, I think the right project, if it included some sort of student housing, we may be able to bump that number up significantly on a unit breaker basis with dormitories um, where you get even more than maybe just a studio. So I think if the right project were to coalesce, um, maybe even that five acres could turn into six or six and a half and included DVC specific student housing. Okay, so let's, let's just put an asterisk here on potential increase in density if need be. Anybody else have anything? I'm sorry, I have to scroll. So if I don't see you, just speak up. I don't wanna disagree with you um, and, and I'm not in a sense. But I think <laughs> for, the purposes, for the purposes of what we're doing, at least for me, my focus is on meeting those RENA numbers across the income categories. So if the density is appropriate, that doesn't mean that we, you know, when we go through our zoning ordinance that we don't look at all the densities uh, we're applying to different localities or zonings. Um, but I, I think when it comes to what we're doing here, uh, it's looking at meeting the RENA numbers. And, and especially in the community of Pleasant Hill, where they're very protective of their sight lines and views and everything else that um, being a little conservative on the densities as long as we're meeting our numbers is is maybe again that's just where i'm coming from is let's meet our arena numbers and then as we go through the zoning ordinance looking at what we can do to to you know set those densities to meet the neighborhood and yet meet our goals that makes sense yep that's why i just put asterisks there let's not automatically bump it up but that's an area where we might have flexibility if we if we need it, I think. Definitely. Okay, so we move on to B. No. Or I think that was Chilpin Chango, so that we can just move on to C then. Winslow Center, Pleasant Hill, Taylor intersection. I guess the big question here is whether Rec, Rec and Park would be willing to sell it. At one point in their master plan, they had this as a gym. And I think like, Pickleball courts, I can't remember what the outdoor activity was, but it was meant to be an indoor gym. And uh, so the question will be what what their current status, their master plan is and what their willingness is, would be to sell it if the right price came up. Right. Does anybody have any comments on this one? This might be one you want to asterisk too, as far as density, at least in that corner. Um, to, to kind of address what Jack was talking about, looking at the overhead of this picture, and this, this came up in some of our community workshops, was that band of green belt that's going through the middle right behind the Winslow Center, that's the creek, and you right. definitely want to try and preserve that creek. So it doesn't necessarily give you all the buildable acres that it might, from a view perspective, think it gives you. And so that, that could impact, one, the density, and two, the buildability of of some of that area right <clears throat> and yeah so and we talked about this yeah during those sessions about having some type of green path going through there and and using the creek as part of that um the overall um development so yeah that may be one of those ones that maybe goes down instead of up or we have to wait and see 
Anybody else, any thoughts on this site? No? Okay. Uh, we'll move on to D. Mangini Lou area. So this, you know, this is this is an area we talked about a lot at the at the um, couple of days charrette that we did, and really trying to. I think we discussed quite a bit about having it mixed density uh, with less dense closer to the current housing, which would be on Apollo, and then more density toward Taylor Boulevard. And Pleasant Hill Road. And Pleasant Hill Road. However, yeah, Pleasant Hill Road. Um, you're gonna get a little bit of pushback from Pleasant Hill Road, because that's quite single family again, right just across the road. But yeah. uh, the highest density being in that quadrant near Taylor Boulevard. A little bit more dense at the bottom and then more moderate along the right side of the picture. Does anybody have any comments on this one? Sure. This I'm, I'm wondering if the 3.2 on the eastern section might be a little bit low. Um, I mean, I'm looking at, what is it? called now the the reserve i think those are eight nine thousand square foot lots and the way this is mapped out would be like thirteen and a half thousand I mean, not accounting for shared areas roads what have you um but given how long it might be until something were to be built here should we try and bump up that 3.2 a little bit uh we certainly could does it, um, does, it, does it matter, Amy? Does it even make much of a difference? Oh, um, I mean, we can certainly bump it up. Um, it would help um, increase the number of units that go into the above moderate category, assuming that you don't go uh, beyond 12 units per acre. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's certainly something that we can explore. Um, we can adjust the build out to try it out yeah i think certainly down in that bottom right portion where mangini fruit stand is you could you know because that's sort of a nice area you could certainly bump that up yeah to even of, even five or six dwelling units per acre yeah and just to give once again the gpac an idea um r10 zoning if you will usually has a density between 3.1 to 4.5, which I think is immediately to the east. And then if you go down to the R7 zoning, you're looking at 4.6 to 7.3 units, roughly per acre. This okay. again, yeah. Yeah. The densities that we're showing on these zones, Amy, these are the threshold densities. These were picked, they're not random numbers. They're picked as being the likely development within that zoning category. Yes. Uh, land use um, designation category. Yeah. Um, yeah. So these are not necessary. Oh, these are not like the maximum uh, developable densities for whatever land use designation they have. Um, we assume a percentage of the maximum to kind of estimate a more realistic development capacity. Uh, so that's why that's why these numbers will are like in between integers, um, and that's what these numbers reflect. Yeah, and sadly, we could be addressing this earlier than later. Uh, I say sadly because Lou Mangini passed away not that long ago, mm -hmm. who was the owner of a big portion of this. And uh, so I, I don't, I don't know what the family plans on doing, but but that uh, possibility may arise earlier than later. Um, but we, you know, we also talked quite a bit, and I assume there'll be, um, you know, some community interest to also have some green area here. So some of these numbers give us that flexibility to make sure we have that green area in this fairly large, uh, large property. It's a good point, maybe something that could be done with the uh, Winslow Center at the same time. Yeah. So anybody else? Will, I see your mute off 
your mute's off. So. Yeah, I'm trying to uh, <clears throat> navigate between uh, what's going on in the background and the conversation here. You know, I, um, I, I am a friend of density, uh, but in this case, you know, I, I, I think that this is the last sort of vestige of Pleasant Hills agricultural heritage. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I'm not so quick to pave over this one. Um, you know, I like the idea of a community garden or some sort of green space or whatever, whatever um, to be incorporated into it. So I'm sort of, um, I'm of the opinion that I would much sooner increase the density on the rest of it and actually preserve the two, um, the the two agricultural areas. Well, the problem is, I'm not sure anybody is going to use it for agriculture because it won't pencil out to use as agriculture. It would have to be more of a park type agriculture situation well, than so a I mean, true agriculture situation, right? Yeah, that's what I mean. Something yeah. you know that's um, something that is. Uh, uh, an, 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 an amenity, an asset to the community. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so right. maybe like trading the Winslow property in exchange for turning the ag pieces into a community park benefit sort of deal and then put the density on the corner of Taylor and Pleasant Hill Road? Something. <clears throat> and also, I mean, the density could be put somewhere else in the city. I mean, I think, you know, we're going to get to other sites where I think the density is way too low. So I don't think it all has to be shoved here. No, I don't think it has to all be shoved here. On the other hand, there is plenty of space here that could accommodate some density without it being right up against, you know, a single family homes where we get the biggest pushback is putting density up against our seven or 10 homes. If you can blend it in more here, this is a large enough piece of property that you can blend that a bit, I would think. Yeah. What if, I, I'm saying it as a consideration. Yeah. I, I'm kind of liking that idea. What if we changed it? Because the southern section right now is the most dense, and I'm almost thinking along the lines of what Will's saying. It's, it's a conversation with maybe the parks, conversations with the owners, conversations with the community. What if we had the park set up on the southern end, keep some ag or educational ag or community gardens, maximize the density on the western triangle um put the 20.9 acres ish maybe off of taylor and then leave the eastern section untouched and then have kind of a new boundary here well looking at this you're only looking at 200 units out of the 2400 that yeah. this, these sites bring us projection wise i still think I mean, I don't know. What's our Pleasant Hill, Pleasant Hill Parks Community Garden is barely a little over a tenth of an acre. I mean, so, uh, you know, yeah. how, how much space are we talking? When a developer comes in, I mean, there's, and we're working on our community benefit policies, um, you know, there's there's definitely community benefit we seek from, from developers, whether that's preserving our green, and well, and we even have a green space requirement. So, I mean, there, there's certain open space requirements. Um, I don't see that this, the density at least meet, that fits into this schematic of what we're doing here, meeting RENA numbers in a sense, is this is not doable exactly what Will and Chadwick are, are talking about here. Um, and I'm looking at them as two separate properties. I'm not, I'm not lumping necessarily Winslow Center property into this, but I think that the density that we have here with only 200 units, we're not looking at a real high density in this area mm -hmm. at all. So I think your plan, Will, is totally feasible within what we're looking at here. Yeah, I think there's enough flexibility in there for sure. Yeah, I mean, if we were to just take off um, just one of the two large farming pieces, I mean, you could build a three-acre park, a two-acre park with an acre garden, and then still develop the other ag piece and everything else here. So I think there's room for everything. Yeah. Keep it in the inventory. Alex? Yeah, <clears throat> can I just ask a quick question? I also noticed that, um, that this also assumes that the seven houses are removed. Um, and I'm just curious, sort of, what does that mean in the sense of 
density. I mean, typically you would have that conversation uh, if you know developer comes in and there's enough density to sort of approach the property owners. But what happens here? Are, are the seven homes that are on this the Mangini and Delu family homes? Troy, do you know? Um, they are, I, I, there's definitely the family homes, if you will, that are on the property. Yeah. Uh, I've talked to uh, at least the, the Lou family, but I don't know if all of them are family homes. If you will. That part, I'm not sure. I, there are definitely a couple. Yeah. I, I, I know there's a couple of tenants up there. Okay. But they're probably owned by Mangina and Delu. They just may be occupied by non-family members. Right. Yeah. Well, I think there's I think there's plenty of I think there's plenty of room for flexibility in here with the densities listed to make areas a little bit more dense in order to allow for more open area. I think I think the numbers that are in here, it certainly could have a lot more density, but I think this allows us flexibility to have some denser area and then some more open areas. Anybody see any other any want any changes made to this as a result of that? Do we want to delineate it that you know this east, north, south section, or do we just want to talk about this whole area potentially just having 200 units on it and give it more flexibility in our discussions in the public workshops? Will? I'd vote for the latter. Just not try and dictate where everything is going to be. Just yeah. um, not do the site planning right now, but just okay. put a number cap that we think and uh, go from there. Does that impact our housing element or will we need to go into that detail at some point in time? The density of the housing may impact um, which income categories these housing uh, units would kind of be assigned to. Right. Um, but yeah, it's not a hard science. There is some flexibility. Um, so yeah, we, we want a plan that works for the community. Um, but, but yeah, there is some implications, but it's not, um, like I said, it's not a hard science. Well, these units are all hitting in the moderate to above moderate categories, so they're not that stingy on this. And we're talking about a clustering type approach, so mm -hmm. your density is just being transferred. Mm -hmm. It will increase a little bit in some places to get an overall density that we're talking about here in order to not lose any units. But still, we're in moderate to above moderate. It's not the really significant stuff we're looking for to meet the arena pieces. Okay. okay. So let's just, let's just, you know, sort of average it out and, and leave it not designated as, as carefully as you have done and, and leave it broader for the workshops. Okay. Okay. Uh, and go on to E. Let's see. There we go. So JFK. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is an interesting one. I, you know, while the highway is there, there are plenty of people that live in apartments next to highways. That doesn't necessarily throw me. Uh, but you do have sort of, I mean, how old are those buildings? They're not that old, are they, Troy? Troy? Uh, sorry, uh, the buildings, the JFK complex, I believe, was built as a larger PUD, and I think if I remember correctly, it goes back to the 80s. Yeah. Okay. So. so. So 30, 40 years old. They've been fully depreciated. They can come down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's more of a cost factor of taking all that down. And it has to be factored in. But um, it, the comment about jobs was a good one. But at the same time, JFK is shut, shutting down like yep. right now, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, it's down. It's shut. Yeah, it's shut. So the jobs are already gone. And I mean, yeah. who who's realistically going to move in there? Yeah, I mean, there was a school that was looking to move in there at one point. Um, but, you know, right after this pandemic, 
yeah. it's, you know, this is the, you know, this is, uh, you know, I'll just segue here, uh, side, side note here. Uh, we are, we did vote at city council Monday night to appeal our RENA numbers. And part of this is, is driven off of, you know, our need to balance. We're a sales tax driven city revenue wise. And to the extent we, or, and you know, and TOT as well, if we lose valuable uh, commercial space uh, that brings us money in and add more residential, which costs us more, uh, we will have we will have some financial issues that we're going to have to address. So uh, while we've got it, we've got to go through this process. We also really have to seriously look at at how we make sure we take care of jobs and commercial areas as well in the city. So it's, you know, it's something we're really going to have to face, you know, in that section of the general plan and, and, you know, and in, in some, you know, more um, uh, near term decisions we're going to have to make. Is this something uh, maybe where uh, the uh, there the school that was interested is still interested. They have yeah. contacted us several times. Just to clarify, yeah. yeah, but they wouldn't take. They'd only take up a handful of floors, right, June? They're not going to take over an entire building, right? I think right now the plan would be that they would uh, take over a couple of floors and they would have offices on the top floor. Oh, okay, but again, okay. Um, this is there. It's just a very exploratory um, yeah. at this point with them. And this is a difficult commercial space, as we've seen with restaurants that were down in this area, had a difficult time surviving because while you can see it from the highway, you can't get to it easy from the highway. And it's, you know, the Chevy's that was there had difficulty and the other uh, restaurant that was down that way had difficulty. So, um, you know, this is a bit of a challenging area for retail, maybe for office space, but not necessarily for retail. So. Oh. I was going to ask too, what if we look at having this be mixed use? I mean, there is the potential if you had that many more units of housing next to the existing apartment complexes, smaller restaurants or cafes or coffee shops or other things may be quite successful there if it's all planned appropriately. Well, especially because you do have um, two long extended, say, um, hotels nearby without food services, right? Great idea. So that could could add to that. So there could be a benefit of doing mixed use here. I like the idea of the 340. I would also like it to be considered a mixed use in heck make 20% of the first floor retail or some other thing. We don't completely lose our sales tax revenue and maybe we give some folks over there a place to eat. Okay. Anybody else have Agreed. Okay. Why only 340 on the site? <laughs> it is next to the freeway. Well, and that's that's something you got to think about too, right? I mean, in the sense of social equity, you know, uh, are you talking lower income housing and then you're putting them off by the freeway? You know. make, just make them really nice. <sighs> With soundproof glass or something, uh, right? Connect to the trail. Because they'd have some trail. nice views of Mount Diablo from there. Yeah, if you go have, high enough up. They'd have great views, connection to the trail, walkability to downtown. There's, there's some good things you can do there. And, and, and to Will's point, not I, I didn't mean to take a swipe at you. Um, Offended. I know. <laughs> um, but when we're when we're looking at, you know, general plan 2040, is this one of those sites that you do look at? more density or more flexibility with as you're planning into the next arena cycle. So um, even if we can't meet our numbers this go around, if we think about this site for cycle seven, eight, what seven, sorry, seven. Um, then then we might have some more room to. to, to well, may, maybe what we do is leave 340 units and just make it mixed use and make, you know, the 340 on top of mixed use on the first floor, whatever that gets us to. I agree as well. I think that we can go higher here. It's next to the freeway. Um, it's across from apartment complexes. Maybe this would be one of those sites that we could consider the over 100 growing units per acre with the mixed use. Who knows if anyone will bite at that level, but 
and we give the flexibility. Well, okay. wouldn't wouldn't it make it more marketable and and sellable in the sense of if you have a higher density, then you're you're you know you're willing to invest the money in that type of development as opposed to uh, if I only can get 340 units, it just doesn't cost out. Yeah, and I'm wondering if they have to go below ground parking and what the other considerations might be. I mean, it, especially with the trail right there, there's, there's some good options for biking, gains, bus stops, other transit modes. I, I think we can afford more units here. Okay, should we just say 70 to 100 dwelling units per acre and make it mixed use? <laughs> Amy's nodding, and I, I think that's great. <laughs> I think she, you're just, just hearing this. She's really nodding, excited. saying, yes, yeah, she got the notes down. <laughs> right, I know, I know. Anybody Amy, else this, on? Oh, Amy, Rick? this designation goes up to what? 100. Yeah. Oh, look so at this that. This designation goes to 100, Perfect. and we're picking 70 as the midpoint. Gotcha. But we All can right. make 70 the minimum and 100 the maximum, and it would fall... Um, a little higher than 70 if we wanted to do that. Well, and I think if we up. can put in range, it's a better, you know, if you put 70 in, people will think that's the max. Yeah, we don't, then we're going to have folks expecting that and they'll come yeah. to talk about the one that's proposed at 73. Yeah. yeah. I, I think we've got to put more of a range in here than a number because people need to know 70 to 100 is more likely not 70 as the midpoint. Gotcha. Yeah, that word assumed, I think, is going to be lost real quick. Very quickly. We can put the range and the assumed part in there. The, the, uh, the assumed part is for our friends that like to do math. <laughs> okay, that's that would be me on the math side. <laughs> I, I mean, in the public realm, it will become oh. the number. Yeah. Like, it won't be assumed. It will be that yeah. is it. Yeah. The target. Good. We just... We can present the ranges. Okay. What's the next level up? 101 to 120? I think it's capped at 100 right now, um, but yes. we can certainly explore higher ranges. Yeah, those are the numbers that the last GPAC we kind of hit upon. Um, there were some members that wanted to go higher. I think I remember Will yeah. saying 120. <laughs> probably Will. <laughs> There's no but, we, I, but I think that it. makes more sense. That makes more sense at DVC than necessarily here. There's a couple sites that that could make sense at, but I think I'm good yeah. here with 100. Okay. Every, everybody okay with that? Alex? Yeah. Alex, poor Alex is jumping in the middle of this. So <laughs> sorry, Alex. No, no, it's to it's totally fine. I um, I also watched your last meeting, so. I'm oh, okay. So you're. Of, so I have some background here. I, I, you know, what I was going to say is that I think that this this could be one of the sides that may help us offset offset some density somewhere else. You know, if, yeah. if this allows us to go a little bit higher or a little bit more dense. I, I mean, it the fact that it's next to a freeway, while I sort of see that as could potentially be difficult, but I also think that that could be a positive in some ways. Um, where it's sort of on the outside looking in versus being on the inside looking out. Um, so I, I do things that there. I do think that this could be potentially a place where we could have a range, and I totally agree with that um, because saying seventy almost sort of caps it at that. So am I hearing one twenty, Alex? He's <laughs> saying one hundred. <laughs> yeah. Alex, you're gonna have to speak up, otherwise people are gonna make comments yeah. for you. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I I think if you know. Um, Right now, if it's if it could be up to 100, then I'll definitely support that. Great. All right, let's put 70 to 100. We can always change. These aren't hard and fast numbers yet. So let's just put that in for the time being. Sounds great. All right, move on to F. Ace Hardware. Now, is this the same owner that owns both? No. The, no. Okay, so why do we put both of them together? Just because it's an underutilized site. There's, okay. Yeah, it's just. So we've got two owners we'd have to deal with here, right? Question. Yeah, Tara. Should we? I mean, say we're going to bump up the density or do a mixed use, 
in essentially Wendy Drive's backyard, should we lump those four houses into the plan? So if a developer comes along and offers to buy those folks out, they can cash out instead of backing up to something or is that silly? Uh, how deep do the residential houses go that way? It's just one, it's four houses and then it's Wendy Drive. Oh, and that's it? It's like a strip just adjacent. Yeah. I'm oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I have no problem with that if there's just four houses behind it. I didn't know if it went deeper there, so. Well, there's a whole neighborhood behind there, but Wendy Drive is like, kind of like the cutoff, and then there's yep. a bunch of houses behind Wendy following along Beth. It's... Oh, okay, I see what you're saying. But if, if so when, is super... up, to, up to Wendy Drive, though. Yeah, it'd be six parcels total. When it's when they're residential homes, we just have to make plans for relocation of it would still families. Be a private, it would still be a private transaction. So you'd assume the developer would be responsible for negotiating something they all like. Yeah, there's no Our, uniform act here. Marion, we have to watch out as we develop this mixed use zone that we deal with the non-conforming use aspect of this because those homes will now have a mixed use designation and we have to make yeah, sure that's a problem. Available. Yeah. And if it's still meeting our, you know, we're still coming close to meeting our numbers. I don't know that we want to open Pandora's box quite yet. No, because I've got a friend who's got a home on across the way somewhere in Doray or something labeled mixed use, but they, it, but basically it's a house and they've had all sorts of difficulties trying to sell that house because it's got to meet mixed use commercial uh, zoning rather than residential. It's been a little bit of a problem. So I think we have to be careful with that. I forgot, Troy, you remember the details of that one, right? Yeah, it's a property that is a zone PAO. Oh yeah, PAO, uh, that's right. what it is. PAO has more aggressive setbacks, which is, um, the problem and it doesn't help that they're on a double frontage yeah mixed use would have less aggressive setbacks wouldn't it it depends how you structure it but i would assume it would but it brings up other issues regarding whether you would put in your code whether a single family residence is a permitted or an even allowed use in mixed use oh. right it would be legal non-conforming if we did anything to it Right. So the issue on that could be some insurance issues for the person, some ability to sell the property. Um, if they wanted to do an expansion and get a you know, home equity loan on their property, they could have problems. So there, there's some things yeah. you're going to do to these properties. Actually, okay. if we were going to do anything in this case, I think I would extend it up on the other over the tap plastics building, because I think that's as underutilized as the estate consignments building is. So that's what I was going to suggest. Yeah. If we were going to extend it all to mixed use, I'd just hop over Masola. Yeah. Masola right, or drive. Right next to that is 1440, 1460 Contra Costa Boulevard, which is apartments. Three, the three right. stories. Those are already free. Right. So, if you, so maybe we can just extend that, that line up over the next commercial building for mixed use. Yeah. And then would, would you also include the 29 Masolo and 21 Masolo as well. Uh, awesome. What's it, 29? It's right next to that plastic. I can't remember what's there. No, that's an office building that's fairly new, isn't it? Yeah, there's an office building next to it, and then behind the office building, it's a fourplex, residential yeah. fourplex. Yeah, yeah so I probably think. not, just probably the top plastics one. Okay. Anybody else on this section? Nope. No. I want to see that span the solo to incorporate the two. Yeah. I mean the actual development. I'm just thinking way in the future. Like a bridge okay. over the solo with a pedestrian walk. Oh geez. I'm saying the solo would <laughs> you go through, you two are scary. through the building. <laughs> Oh boy. Yeah. All right. Drive through building. Let's please move to G before we get some really <laughs> funky design structure here. Okay. 
apologize. This should say the Gregory Gardens. That's okay. We all know it is the grocery outlet. <laughs> the <building laughs> in. Okay. Um, I mean, thoughts they, on this? They could fix their density by fixing their parking lot. Mm -hmm. I like the mixed use angle here. And it would be catty corner to another mixed use development. I mean, if we had a couple of good projects lined up, you could have a really cool like secondary downtown sort of deal. Yeah. Yeah. No, it'd be it would be a good mixed use place. I I agree. Is uh, so if you did thirty, this is four acres. So that wouldn't be too dense. That'd probably be only a couple of stories above above the um, commercial retail area, right? Yeah, it could be um, a three-story total building. Yeah. Which would stay under fifty feet. Yeah. For sure. So I think that I think that works pretty well. And you're right. And then, I mean, the parking. There's a lot of parking there. Anybody else have any other thoughts on this one? Keep it. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I'm scrolling quickly. All right, uh, let's move on to H. Out. Yeah, that's out. All right. Out. On to I. So this is the one that I would need to recuse myself. Yep. Um, okay. So I'll come off. Alex, the I'll text. I'll text you when we move on to the next one. We'll try and be quick. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I, my concern here is you've got two very new buildings. I mean, the Walgreens is very new and Zio Fredo's, well, that burnt down and got rebuilt and both of those are pretty new buildings. Um, on the south side of Gregory, I think there's more potential. And maybe to the east side of Zio Fredo's. But I have a hard, I'm hard pressed to figure out how Walgreens we're going to get. I mean, it's a pretty popular Walgreens. Yeah, and Walgreens yeah, doesn't pick bad locations for its store, so they're not going anywhere. No. <laughs> and they might not. But I, I I like this idea, and I'm I'm kind of glad that it came up because again, this is is kind of a disconnected area from. Pleasant Hill, when you think of Pleasant Hill, you know, it's Contra Costa Boulevard, it's Crescent Drive. So this could be, in a sense, a prime location in a lot of ways. And it might be piecemealed out, it might be done in segments. But I, I like the overall idea of mixed use in that area where you're going to retain your restaurants, you're going to retain your small shops and your mini market or whatever might happen there, but still have all the housing units. I don't, I don't really see an issue with it. It might not happen, but it, de it definitely would be a nice area to see it happen. You're just adding housing on top of everything that's already there. Yeah, but I can't, yeah. I mean, Walgreens isn't gonna have no. housing built on top of their current building. No, but it might be the anchor. Or is it Alfredo's for that matter? Old man, I don't know how long he's gonna stay in the business. It doesn't mean it wouldn't sell. Right. But would, it, would it be a piece of property that sold and is the is the beginning of it, and is Walgreens kind of your anchor for it? Because it is kind of a fit all store. Um, you can get your groceries there, some of them. Um, you know, well, and produce so, markets across the way. So for now, <laughs> you know, for now. until it gets bulldozed. <laughs> yeah, but again, if you know, Walgreens might be the anchor to make it even more, um, a little know, bit more vital in area. Yeah. Should, you know, should we include the gas station in this? Well, that opens a whole nother Pandora's box from taking a gas station out. No, I'm not but, taking it out, but giving the, the option to you. I mean, well, there'd be at, a, there's a lot of remediation that would have to happen with that too before you make yeah. it housing. Of course there is tens and tens of thousands of dollars of remediation depending on a particular gas station site. But Sorry, uh, finish and I can I can jump in after that. All right. I, I'm, I'm thinking just beyond our current cycle, maybe the next one. I, I don't see anything happening to gas stations now, but in 2035, I've seen a very different car landscape than you have today. 
that gas yeah. station goes out of business, it could be an eyesore. And if we adjust the zoning now to give that owner flexibility, they could take three or four years remediating the site, but then it could match the rest of this area if gas sales plummet and the sea store can't stay alone. Yeah, you actually uh, mentioned what I was going to say in that um, for this cycle's housing element, um, we uh, the sites that we choose, um, HCD will be looking at whether or not they are likely to build within the next eight years. And so as um, I think Will brought up, uh, there's a lot of remediation that's involved with gas stations. So um, yeah, I don't know, maybe it's part of the general plan where like you look uh, more into the future. Like if we do want to, you know, start prepping the site for the seventh cycle, that might be something that we talk about in the general plan, for instance. Right. Right. So from a housing element, probably not but from a general plan, we might. Yeah. Can you guys note that so we make sure we don't forget that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I would just as a holistic approach, me planning to die in Pleasant Hill and wondering what the heck we're going to do with our gas stations and the potentially zero carbon economy. You're going to put a Tesla supercharger station in there. Yeah, you're not going to need that many unless people are going to charge at home or in their apartments. No, are you kidding? I get I get free charging on the at the Tesla chargers. Why would I do it at home? You don't. Or you do. I don't. But. Oh, sorry. What can I tell you? <laughs> you know, what's interesting, though, Chadwick, is um, I've been approached by 7-Eleven on a couple of different occasions about building a gas station at Oak Park and Patterson. So, you think it'll pencil? I, well, I don't think it'll ever happen in the sense of that yeah. piece of property. Yeah. But they're still going around and they're still planning on building gas stations. So I don't know what the mentality is behind that. Well, they get their money back in seven years, cash flow for another seven to 10. Yeah. It doesn't matter. I mean, that we yeah, it's still going to be around in seven to 10 years. It's just after that. Yeah, but we as a city then may end up with dilapidated parcels in 2040. I mean, we're not that far away, but electric cars are supposed to have cost parity in 2025 or 2026. It'll become an economics decision. And then we as a city are going to have a smattering of these stations that we'll have to deal with. Yeah. So let me ask you guys this, where, where the produce market is next to that is you've got dentist office and things like that along Pleasant Hill Road. Do we extend it down a little bit past the dentist office? Where are you looking? So, oh, I see what you're saying. No, um, looking to your left on no, looking to your left from the produce market, right? Right, is right. a dentist's office, which could also be oh, you know, first level of a mixed use, right? Yeah, why not? You know, no. that stops at the stops at the beginning of Greenwich, right? It doesn't have to happen tomorrow but it could happen and no but i'm just thinking if we're gonna if we're gonna designate that would be a you know a, a building that you could certainly do mixed use in it's commercial currently you can still have a dentist office on the first floor yeah yeah but one above the dentist can live where he works yeah, yeah. anyway i i think we ought to add that little segment in there i agree We, we like the bigger mixed use and can we go with not including this in the housing loan at this time, but including it in your general plan? Works for me. Yeah, that's fine. Gas station in the dentist office, general plan, not housing loan. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. We'll, give Wal we'll give Walgreens a heads up. <laughs> yeah. All, All right. right, let me, let me let Alex know he can come back on before we move on. This next one confuses me. Go to the next slide, Amy. Ah, uh, what's confusing about it? I'm confused too. Hey, let's make sure Alex gets back on. Right now, he's okay. So that does include the pancake house, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. That's what I was, I'm not seeing it oh, there labeled on there. So I just Alex, we've turned your house into a mixed use <laughs> designation. All right. 1,000 so units per acre. Yeah, one, yeah exactly. <laughs> Thank you. 
So the <laughs> pancake house is at the very far bottom right corner. Right. And at the last GPAC meeting, um, you had asked us to extend this northerly up to include right. the Sun Valley Inn, as, yeah. uh, making that a more viable site and a potential redevelopment that could uh, dress up that key corner of the downtown. Yeah. Why wouldn't we continue that on up further north? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> why didn't we say that last time? <laughs> and, you yeah. know, I mean, you've got the post office, you've got a, you know, Calico Corners, all those things could be on the first floor of anything. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I think those are underutilized sites all the way up to the grocery outlet, except for the gas station. So, you know, take out that Chevron gas station. But all the way from there up to Casper's, I don't know why we wouldn't do that the whole way up. Didn't I recommend we mix use that whole strip? That sounds like something I would have said. Yeah, I think um, in the, the GPAC alternative, um, a lot of Contra Costa Boulevard um, was redesign redesignated to mixed use. And I think okay. we had identified these key sites as areas that are likely to redevelop. Um, yeah. To housing. Yeah, well, yeah, that's probably true. And if we okay. don't need them, maybe we, if for the general plan, we do it, but not necessarily for the housing element. We can Same save that for the seventh cycle. Same as yes. before. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. So uh, is yes. everybody okay with that density, mixed use? Yes. To me, the density is way low for this site. 52 units. Yeah, but you have to leave room for a brewery on the first floor. Oh, yeah, good point. A brewery? I, I mean, it would be nice. And that requires higher root, that requires a higher ceiling. It does, so you, just be mindful. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, no, this was seriously discussed at one point. That's why, I mean, I this was, that was a serious option at one point. It was during my orientation with Greg that he mentioned there was discussions in the brewery. And it's, yeah. it stuck with me. I think it's a good idea. But I think it was meant to not be a brewery, but a brew pub, brew yeah. pub, which doesn't require the high ceilings for a brewery. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, what do you what are you thinking on housing? I mean, to to well to yield only fifty two units on a two point three five acre site, um, right smack in the middle of our downtown. Um, sorry, I might have to mute here for a second. I have a upset you know, guy here. Um, interested in going to the seventy. Are you, are you yeah, like I'm thinking like double. <laughs> I'm thinking like like double this or more. Um, a, a lot, a lot more. When, the when, you, the... when you look at it being next to two worlds, and and then facing Contra Costa and or Gregory, I, I gotta agree with you. I mean, it's but you've got one story stuff all around you, including down, including across the street, and, and next to you, and. Two worlds oh, is what three story? Yeah, it's all it's all retail. It's all retail. Retail doesn't matter, does it? I think the proprietor of uh, Nations would welcome a few hundred units here. That oh, I'm sure that cafe. I'm sure that Nations would <laughs> yeah. appreciate that. And all, but... and, all the, and all the rest of them. Starbucks, Farringtons, all of them welcome. Yeah, yeah I, I still want my roof up there, but I think we can. St cram it in with That's tough luck chadwick i'd move oh. your brew pub across the way somewhere <laughs> okay no those you, you, know, you know i'm a friend of beer also so you, you know you're you're pulling at my heartstrings here with the, oh geez um we're deteriorating uh, here guys fast <laughs> all right i think the, the point is let's see if we can go to the 70 unit break the level here maybe 70 on top of mixed juice is that what you were suggesting, Will? Um, I I threw out doubling it at one point. That would be have 60, a compromise of fifty. But, well, um, what's that? What's that range when you're using fifty as being that midpoint? It was forty to seventy, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. It was forty to seventy. Let's use. Amy, is that what it is? Forty to seventy. We can do forty to seventy. All right, let's put forty to seventy and put the range in. No problem. Um, 
I do want to ask though, so 30 dwelling units per acre was the assumed residential density for our, our mixed use um, designation. Um, does that mean you guys would consider two types of mixed use, one with a higher density and one with a lower density for less intense areas, or did you want to just kind of up it all around? You know, we had talked about two separate levels of mixed use at uh, one of our previous meetings, having a mixed use medium and mixed use high density. So I'm fine with doing it that way. Ultimately, yeah, I'm too. Didn't we just you say were doing a higher mixed use on the uh, university? JFK. Well. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't we say it was going to be a hundred with mixed use? Yeah. yeah that so one we're going to have to have a we're going to have to have a bigger mixed use category. Yeah. So we've got the seventy uh, to hundred. We've got the forty to seventy. Um, did we want another one, or are we comfortable with those two? Comfortable with those two. Yeah, I think those two. I work. think that's. I think those work. Okay, so I, I think in terms of like, for example, the previous site, um, the previous intersection we were looking at, we would bump that density up to the 40 to 70 range. Right. Okay, will do. And, and then this one as well. Okay. Okay. You have, you have JFK, JFK University then is at the 100, so then you... That's our mixed use of high. That's another one beyond that. Okay, so we got 40 to 70, 70 to 100. Yes. Perfect. Yeah, and then we might have to do a higher one for like a DVC or something at some point, but let's start with those two. All right, we'll move on to K. Trying to do my alphabet right here. <laughs> so Sorry, let me go back on that last one. Did we extend the site any? No, no we're going plan. to extend the site for general plan, not for housing element. Okay. 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 So yeah. how did we select this neighborhood? I, I don't recall the discussion on this. So I'm trying to figure out how we came up with picking on the poor families that live on Jewel Lane. Because uh, there's already a proposal in the works to turn this into uh department complex. I mean, we had a planning commission oh. review session on this very set of homes. Oh, okay. So it kind of makes I, sense. I was unaware of that. So I, that's why I, I, I didn't know how all of a sudden this appeared on that. Yeah, um, the certain, I'm not gonna name the person who is- I know, I know who it is. Yeah, I, so I, I remember now. He's been talking to the folks and it sounds like at least four of them are on board for the proposal, a couple maybes. Um, we had given feedback about parking and maybe working with the trail. So okay. I think this, us rezoning this would be welcome to that potential development if not uh, expanding. Okay. Well, we so. have the senior apartment complexes down there, right? Next door to that on the yes, yeah, so it's near oh, you have the trail, got good access to the freeway there, great access to downtown there. I, I think it can support some higher density. What's what's to the right of it? Remember that That's property right. we we gave away that little corner stretch, right? No, but I mean, the, the, the L shaped upside down L shaped building, what's that? Uh, it's a two-story apartment complex that the folks that usually park in Contra Costa. Oh, okay. Yeah. So maybe we include that as well. Yeah, I would I would include mm -hmm. that as well. And I think this is already multifamily, fairly dense zoning. Any anyway. um, is that an official designation? Multifamily fairly dense? <laughs> I can't remember if it's high density or medium density, but it's it's denser than you know your R10 or R7. Actually, yeah. technically reasonably dense. Reasonably. Reasonably, dense. not fairly <laughs> dense. I'm well, thinking we've got some fairly density. dense brains right now. <laughs> Is the uh, proposal um, something that we could get our hands on at this point um, because if we're going to be 
estimating um, housing capacity. If there is a proposal in the works, we like to use uh, those numbers instead of just estimating. Um, what is, do you think it's at a point where it can be shared with us? Uh, it's not a formal proposal. It was brought in as a study session. And then gotcha. there was an issue with one of the property owners that were included in this um, uh, study session that really did not have an interest in participating. So gotcha. okay. I don't know where it is right now. Okay, thank you. So do we include this, this apartment complex in the general plan or do we include it in the housing element? Housing element. Okay. Housing element. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. All right, L. So part of this land we're we've already we've just given to or sold to Habitat for Humanity, isn't that right? Yes. So that piece of it is not going to can't really be included. Okay, we can take that out. This is going to be challenging too, because even though you're not, it's, are you are you really saying we're not prohibited from building the floodplain? Because I just sat through days worth of like sessions on floodplain development and displacement of waters and liability with downstream flow. It doesn't seem like we can realistically count on any of this. Um, Contra, contra, contra past the flood control district parcels. I mean, maybe we could do the privately owned one that is on Beatrice Road there, but it's only a couple, it's only an acre and some change. <sighs> yeah, this one, this one's a tough one, in my opinion. We looked at this, you know, when we were looking at different options for the library as well. And this was complicated and very difficult to even think about. We just sort of crossed it off because of the complexities of the floodplain and the personal ownership and everything else in this section. The only way I could see this working is with respect to the BFE is if you had first floor parking and then a couple stories above that parking on oh. that walk. gallery walk. You just, but, that's, I mean, yeah. you're describing gallery walk. Yeah, but without causing water to go flow into any of the other neighborhoods either. Mm -hmm. So is the gray section, the, the floodplain section and the, those other two parcels not? Correct, the shaded areas are owned by the flood control district. Okay, so <laughs> not that the other two are not in a floodplain, they're just not owned by flood control. Right. Did we check to see if there's a flowage easement on that big one? Uh, check to see it. Um, could you repeat your question? Is there a flowage easement on the parcel that is on mm -hmm. that is formerly Beatrice Road? Because if there's a flowage easement there, we can't really use it either. And yeah, um, yeah that is not something we checked. There's there's got to be a reason why that over an acre large parcel hasn't been developed yet, right? Yeah, these these parcels appear to be in zone AE, so they do have flood issues. So I would I would say you're going to have problems. Yeah, if I can answer the question. Uh, yes, they are in a floodplain, and as obviously you know, for the right reason, most people do not get excited to go and build anything there because of the. Uh, how do you remedy you know a floodplain especially it's already buried there so it will take a lot to you know make some improvements there but it's not impossible but it will cost a lot of money because that means you had to do some major improvements on the downstream end and also on the upstream end so then the question for the housing element would be what's the likelihood that this would truly be developed the eight years would be very tough. Most people would pick another location than this location. So how about we consider not keeping this in the housing element? I, this one, I, oh. you know, let's see if we if we don't if we need it. Let's figure it out. If we don't need it, this may be one that 
makes more sense to not include. Yeah, given the numbers we're looking at, if we hold this in reserve. Yeah. You know, put it back in the bullpen. We'll call it up when we get to the seventh inning. Yeah. All right, right, will do, okay? Okay. Uh, will, you didn't come at me. I'm just Ooh. thinking, and and with that, JFK goes to 125. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. I thought you were going to do Mangini going somewhere higher. Okay, Monument Triangle area. This one, I think, has got a lot of potential, this area. What's our For, net loss out of that, though? With If we, we're including the mobile home park, and I'm assuming those count as uh, housing units? Oh, do they? I would assume they do. I mean, they're dwellings in a sense. So, Rick, Amy, does that? Yes. So you're going to have a net loss of affordable housing. Oh. Plus, you're going to have issues with relocation of all these units, unless they've already been. If the owner well, has you can, them, you can, it out. You can split this in half and not include the um, mobile harm park. Well, but this is because this area is certainly underutilized down here. And, and you do have a large advocate. I mean, I remember <clears throat> Concord going through this with rent control and other things on mobile home parks. They have a, a, a loud voice and they're strong yeah. advocates and it could be very challenging to displace those people. But if we do the, the you know, the, the bottom half, bottom left half, not including the, the mobile home park, because that's fairly un underutilized and certainly could be mixed use. We did hear that some of those mobile homes had been um, reverted to the owner and I'm not sure what the circumstances are out there. Um, but one of the things we could do is look into that and get back to you before you make a final decision. Okay. Yeah, definitely explored. I mean, if they're condemned and or abandoned. Yeah, how many, how many net left? I don't see a lot of traffic coming in and out of there these days. Not like I used to. So, no. I'm not opposed okay. to keeping it in. I just, I'm cautious is all. Okay. Are we okay with the density here or? So, yes. Uh, and I think of traffic um, yeah. when, I, when I talk about this. Not yeah, only just... because of the neighborhood, but when you look at that more to... 680 corridor it's a nightmare in the morning and it's a nightmare in the evening and until we get traffic under control and or vehicle miles travel down it would just be worse yeah i had a meeting on that this morning so or earlier this afternoon i should say an hour meeting on some discussions about that because the lisa lane intersection is a tricky one as well going down to that school okay uh, all right, we'll leave that as is then until we find out more on the mobile home park. MN. Former JC Penny. I mean, this is a, this will be a prime spot to put dense housing in. Mixed use. Is it, this isn't mixed use, right? Is it? Uh, it, it, no, sorry. It's just residential. Hold on. The actual density should be 49.9 which would create um the capacity for 215 units okay all right fixed our flood control. oh sorry what was that fixed our flood control question yeah that takes over the flood control <laughs> oh, issue <okay. laughs> an offset to the flood control flood instead control. of doing jfk like will suggested <laughs> oh my gosh Um, but are we not doing this mixed use here? Does it need to be? No, it doesn't need to be. I'm just thinking for residential people to be sort of next to, well, I guess probably not. They got enough retail around them, but I wouldn't be opposed if it was, but I would still maintain the same density of residential units, but I would, I would be okay with mixed use there as well. I think why not? Why not do mixed use? You've already got a bunch of those uses here, a first floor coffee shop, a restaurant, right. or a bar, or whatever. It, it, it makes sense in this location. Yeah. 
yeah, it fits more than just straight residential to me. I mean, it's, yeah. And, and, and we're trying to recoup the potential lost sales tax dollars from, not that it was a lot, but from the JCPenney home store, <laughs> you know, so by having some retail in that location, it would be helpful. So would we do this then at the like 40 to 70 mixed use level? Like we had, she, I think Amy said it was 49 was the assume and our yes. bracket there is 40 to 70 mixed use. Yeah. 40 to 70 mixed use. Yeah. All right. Okay. With a, uh, with a underground tunnel over to the veranda. No, no, that's concrete. Absolutely we want the sales not. dollars in Pleasant Hill. What are you talking about? I, I get the sales tax dollars. I'm looking at the marketability and the development. Uh, all right. Well, that's that's the developer's problem, not ours. Exactly. Okay. I think a uh, nice trail to Grayson Creek and connecting with all of our other, other trails. Yeah, yeah, yeah and to whatever they do on DV Plaza. Yep. Yep. To Ken's point, I would recommend a gondola. <laughs> <laughs> well, where's your monorail thing? You had? We're going to have a zip line. <laughs> a zip line. Do a zip too. line. <laughs> okay. All right. We're totally off the rails. Uh, totally off the rails. Okay. <laughs> MNO. I guess that's, we're done. We only, we're up to N, right? Then we had. Yep. That's it. Okay. Are we supposed to suggest sites now? Yes. I'd like to. May I make a suggestion? Absolutely. As long as it's not my house, we'll be all right. <laughs> How about we take a look at the uh, Don Edwards location and make that an excuse? Yeah. I mean, he did ask yeah. for it. No, absolutely. How would we paint that? So, uh, does Amy, do you have a parcel viewer handy? Um, I can pull up a map. So, if I were to imagine that, I suppose we would probably start at 571 Contra Costa and maybe go up to, uh, I mean, why not just take it all the way to Pacheco, go up to second? Maybe we include it in the general plan, but not the housing element, and we just include the southern couple of parcels in the housing element and do the rest of the general plan. So was that, I heard you say 571. So okay, I so put that in. 571 is where the Caltrans right away kind of um, sandwiches everything. And then moving north along that strip, you're going to hit one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, uh, nine parcels or so until Second Avenue. I don't think many of these are going to turn over. Some of these are very successful businesses. There'd be no reason to believe there'd be an issue. But 20 years from now, we might have a situation where they can put uh, housing on top. Um, so maybe we include this in the general plan amendment but not in this housing for next year yeah i think yeah i think the general plan as well and i think the property across the way where the big five is that's an older shopping area that could go to mixed use as well i think i would think you're talking like 508 to 510 yeah Constant. yeah i'd be fine with that i mean heck i'd be saying i'd be fine with bracketing all the way from the target up to pacheco you got about a dozen, uh, 18 parcels there. Yeah. It I agree. Who knows when it's going to happen, but it gives folks flexibility. It sets expectations for the next yeah, I think, years. I think in a general plan, I think those are all good options. I think for the housing element, I think, well, I, don't, I, I, th I think we're fine with the JC Penny store and Again, I think if we go through what we've done at this point and take a look at it, we leave the the other spots sort of in abeyance in case we need them or for the next cycle. Because yeah. Rick, didn't you say it was going to be more difficult to use sites over again that weren't developed during the eight-year period? If you use a site that's under underutilized or partially developed, that's what these would be and you use those for one previous cycle, then they get by right obligations the next time you use them in order to push them forward more. So oh. if we don't need to count them right now, because they're not likely yeah. in the next eight years, it's better just to Leave put them, them on the bench, put them in the general okay. plan as mixed use. Now, the good thing is if something happened in the next five years and they suddenly flip, even if they're not in your housing element, you still get to count them. Right, toward it. All right. Okay. 
hope that our first comments are hearing this. Well, okay. I, so in, to kind of address Frank saying, and that, that comes from, uh, an, they wanted to use one of their properties, this they, Dunn Edwards downsized. They have 4,000 square feet of retail space. They wanted to essentially make it an office space and it's not zoned for that. So what he's looking for ultimately is for us to look at how we're designating our zoning and some of our retail areas where they can have a broader ability to market the property and use the property. And that might've been some right. of the challenges they're facing. So that was really a zoning and designation issue, not necessarily a plan to redevelop and turn it into housing. But our mixed use is gonna allow for office, retail, yeah. I mean, yeah. It's going to be flexible. I remember when we talked about setting it up, Frank could do any number of things there. Right. Definitely and gives them more flexibility and options. I do think we want look to look carefully at how we define our mixed use and, uh, you know, making sure that we do preserve the commercial that we have. Uh, we, we would not want it to easily slip into something where you've got just a tiny bit of commercial and uh, an enormous amount of housing. So there's some refining that we, I think we need to do um, in the planning section on that. Right. Yeah. The, the other area, you know, that I think would be good for whether it be in the general plan or would be the area where Kinders is. Taylor and Morello. Yeah, Taylor and Morello. That's a, you know, it's a little bit of an area now that's got some restaurants, gas station, uh, you know, the oncology center. But to me, that would be an, a good area for mixed use as well at some point. Could you repeat the intersection again? Taylor and Morello. Taylor and Morello. Can you direct me to the part of the city? <laughs> uh, go down and left. Go down and left. Taylor, got there it. Go. There you go. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you've got quite a complex there. Uh, an older complex, I have to say. Um, and you've got some office buildings across... Well, I guess down right. the way a little bit. No, that's, I think, I think you're thinking Gregory and Carr's area as the oncology center. No, you're talking, uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, Across Morello. The... You're talking Norse and, right. and Taylor as opposed to Taylor and Morello. I can oh, see this right, that Nor oncology center, the Norse. Yeah, yeah. But there's some areas I think along Taylor here and there that that have some commercial that could have a little bit of mixed use in it that don't right now. And I'm not sure we have to do it now, but I think we have to look at it from a general plan perspective. Yes. Okay. Anybody else have any other areas that they wanna talk about? Okay. Can we just address real quick, how, how do you identify and determine vacant lots? Are these just empty parcels that are somehow known to us? That I'm, I'm not sure how we know. Sure. Um, so part of our process is that we start with assessor data. Um, and in that assessor database, usually they'll have an existing use code. And through that, we can identify where they have identified um, vacant areas. Um, but it's not never usually 100%. So step two of that process is that we'll typically do an aerial scan to make sure there aren't any weird parcels that they've included in there. Um, and then the next step after that, you know, we work with staff to, because, uh, you know, sometimes the aerials that we're working with, like Google, um, they're not 100% up to date. So maybe there's something there that we don't know about. And so it goes through a series of vetting processes um, to make sure that we get an appropriate set of vacant sites. Very good. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, what's next, Rick, Troy, Amy? Do we have anything else we need to cover tonight? That was most of what we needed to have you cover. We can just give you a, uh, 
update for next steps. Um, and that is we're looking to have a virtual community uh, meeting on alternatives, as I mentioned earlier, about having the public give input. That's going to be scheduled on July 14th. Um, that's a Wednesday night. And uh, Troy, did we have a time for that starting time? Uh, 5.30. 5.30. 5.30. So we're going to be having, uh, it won't be a lot of breakouts, but we will present all the information, go through all the different sites and have open mic to allow people to give us their input on the different sites, the different ideas. We'll also present them the different designations that are being discussed, um, have some illustrations about uh, what density means, what the heights mean. We'll also introduce some of the other topics that didn't get covered tonight, which is like the accessory dwelling units uh, and build it in the community and those types of things as well. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Anything else we need to address? Okay. So hopefully as many of you can join July 14th as possible. Um, I think it will be interesting to hear from the public, their input on this. There's always a lot of discussion on density, wherever it may be. So that will be an interesting discussion to hear from the public. Um, and welcome, Alex. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> and um, we look forward to seeing everybody on July 14th then. See y'all there. Okay. Great. Thank you all. Great. Thank Thanks you very much. Everyone. Good night. Good night.